tonight is the topic on which Madam Secretary will be delivering the Alexander Lecture. And so, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please can I ask you now to deliver the 2019 Alexander Lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony, for that very kind introduction and recap. Uh, welcome, Francis, and welcome to all of you for coming here. And it's nice to know that we, as always, break the ground and bring Alexander Lecture outside of London by coming to Hong Kong. So I, I, I thank you all for uh, making this um, uh, uh, happening here. Um, what I believe you have in front of you is um, an index of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I don't give you the full paper because I want you to listen to me rather than to read it, um, um, so that I can read it and without you <laughs> checking whether I've read it right or not. Um, you, you will see that I've sort of divided it into a number of topics, and therefore by going about it, I hope with that index it might help you to see and put all, all the things together. Now, for today's Alexander Lecture, I find no better way to start by referring to the very famous opening of Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two Cities. It is the best of times. It was the worst of times. It is the best of times for investor-state dispute settlement, as evidenced by, by the high level of attention of the international community on the subject, as well as the empirical data, the number of publicly known treaty-based ISDS claims as of 31st July last year, uh, that is 2019, therefore, uh, according to the lecture still this year, uh, t t um, had already increased to over 980, with over 70 cases filed each year in the past three years, and no sign showing that the momentum of the upward trend of the number of ISDS cases is slowing. However, paradoxically, it is also the worst of times for ISDS. The arbitration community witnesses that the ISDS is currently facing a challenge to its legitimacy. In its fact sheet published in July 2018, the European Commission announced that anything less ambitious, that is than the investment court system, including coming back to the older investor state dispute settlement is not acceptable for the EU ISDS is dead, end, end of quote. ISDS has been relentlessly criticized by the media and the civil societies, calling it with names like secret corporate courts, kangaroo courts. Some states have lost their faith in ISDS, as shown by the denunciation of Bolivia, Ecuador, and Venezuela from the exit convention, and the increase in the termination of the bilateral investment treaties. It is in this context I will explore with you the chaos in the landscape of ISDS and attempt to map the way forward in search for order by evolution, not revolution. And to embark on this voyage in the sea of chaos, let us briefly reflect on the history of ISDS and look at the major concerns as a prelude to the chaos. I will then take you through the diverse attempts of reform made within the chaos, and lastly, propose a double helix approach for the search of order. In the early days, foreign investors could only resort to domestic courts of host states or appeal to their home states to initiate diplomatic protection under international law. Then there was the gunboat diplomacy, illustrated uh, literally by the Don Pacifico affair involving the British citizen who suffered damages caused by a righteous mob in Greece, which then led to the sending of British military ships into the agency to seize Greek property in compensation for the damages. It is against such background that the world saw the need for a peaceful, depoliticized, credible, and rule of law based dispute resolution mechanisms. And that is where international arbitration come into the picture of ISDS. Well, it is apt to remind ourselves about the basic features of arbitration and allow me to summarize into two main tenets. Agreement to arbitrate, which results from a simple and informal process creating a formal and binding award, and party appointment of arbitrators. 
The merits of such basic features of arbitration have been illustrated in the Alabama Claims Arbitration under the Treaty of Washington back in 1871 between the United States and Great Britain. In particular, this successful arbitration managed to avert an imminent war between the nations caused by Great Britain's failure to use due diligence in the performance of its neutral obligations during the American Civil War. As chronicled in our good friend Johnny Vida's historical keystone to international arbitration, the success of the Alabama claims arbitration in resolving the dispute peacefully was very much a result of the party, appointed mod party appointment model under which the five-person arbitral tribunal was formed with one arbitrator nominated by the United States, one by Great Britain, and three by neutral states. 1959 was a symbolic year for the ISDS regime as we saw the conclusion of the world's first bilateral investment treaty between Germany and Pakistan. And again, as remarked by Cal uh, Professor Karlheinz Bosch-Stiegel, BITs have created a universal system of substantive and procedural investment protection, which is a fundamental and a most relevant part of the international legal and economic order a milestone which has replaced the traditional David-Goliath relationship between foreign investors and host jurisdictions, at least procedurally, by a level playing field. It is worth noting that the Germany-Pakistan BIT only contained the state-to-state -state dispute settlement mechanism. It is not until the BIT between Italy and Chad in 1969 that BITs began offering investment arbitration between foreign investors and host jurisdictions. And as the story goes, Hong Kong, a city in the East, has somehow played an important role, uh, an important role in the rich history of treaty-based ISDS. A Hong Kong incorporated company and a Sri Lankan shrimp farm were all in it together to trigger the exponential growth in treaty-based ISDS we have witnessed today. In the famous AAPL versus Sri Lanka case, a Hong Kong incorporated company involved the UK Sri Lanka BIT, which was extended to Hong Kong back in 1981. With respect to the destruction of a shrimp farm by the Sri Lankan government security forces culminating in the award in 1990 and the birth of the idea arbitration without privity where a standing offer to arbitrate is made by a host state in the investment treaty, which is substantially converted into an agreement when a foreign investor perfects it, uh, that consent through a request for arbitration. Nevertheless, also as remarked by Jan Paulsen, of course, who coined the phrase arbitration without privity, um, in his seminal piece back in 1995, arbitration without privity is a delicate mechanism a single incident of an adventurous arbitrator going beyond the proper scope of his jurisdiction into a sensitive case may be sufficient to generate a backlash. Hong Kong, again, somehow, may have contributed to the current situation of ISDS. Hong Kong is not a sovereign state, but within the framework of one country, two systems, and as provided for in the basic law, the Central People's Government has authorized Hong Kong as a special administrative region to enter into 21 investment promotion and protection agreements with foreign economies, one of which being the United Kingdom concluded back in 1999. Now, all of these IPPAs contain investment arbitration mechanism and one very high profile case is, of course, the Philip Morris Asia versus Australia case, in which Philip Morris invoked the 1993 uh, uh, agreement between Hong Kong and Australia to challenge the tobacco plain packaging regulation. Cases like Philip Morris and Australia uh, which concern important public policies were indeed the types of sensitive cases that might be said to have brought us to the current 
backlash of, uh, against ISDS, the growing disenchantment with the investment treaty regime, the skepticism, whether rightly or wrongly, that the regime is heavily skewed towards the benefits of multinational national corporations at the grave expense of host states and public interest. The major concerns and criticisms of ISDS is what I want to look at now. I think there are generally three main areas. The first is that of inconsistencies. Inconsistencies may arise when different tribunals come to different conclusions about the same standard in the same treaty. Inconsistencies may also arise when different tribunals organized under different treaties reach different decisions about disputes involving the same facts, related parties, and similar investment rights, as well as when considering disputes involving similar situations and similar investment rights. No one would deny that there may be some irre irreconcilable awards, such as the two cases related to the Argentina's economic crisis back in the early 2000s, the CMS versus Argentina and the LG and E Argentina cases. However, one would reasonably suspect that the extent of inconsistencies in ISDS awards may have been overstated and exaggerated. Absolute consistency in ISDS is but an illusion, like a desert mirage. Even in, the con even in the context of domestic court systems with a few mechanisms, perfect consistencies do not exist. And it is not uncommon to see dissenting views in court judgments slowly evolving to become the law over time. In fact, as Johnny Vida said, arbitration can benefit from good dissenting opinions. Such dissents are more often, if rationally and courteously expressed, a sign of healthy intellectual rigor within the arbitral deliberations. And Bridget Stern, in an ISDS reform conference held in Hong Kong in February in 2019, said this, inconsistency is part of life. When contradictions stop, it is death. Inconsistency is an inevitable part in the development and evolution of any body of law. And if we take Emmanuel Gayard's Darwinist's view on the matter, with a con continuous stream of investment jurisprudence and growing doctrinal analysis, the best decisions will emerge as jurisprudence constants and prevail over those isolated mishaps. However, it appears that patience may have been lost, and some feel that they can no longer wait for the ISDS regime to self-correct to address the concern over inconsistencies. In the context of investment treaty arbitration, it appears that as compared with international commercial arbitration, which usually concerns contractual transactions between private parties, a higher level of consistency and coherence is expected of the awards when matters of public importance are at stake. The second concern is that of the arbitrators, impartiality and their diversity. This criticism closely relate to the inconsistency of the ISDS awards um, is this decision makers and that is the arbitrators. Party appointment has become an original sin these days with arbitrators being perceived as being influenced by their desire for future appointments instead of only the merits of the case and being biased in favor of multinational corporations. Nevertheless, if one takes an objective view of the empirical evidence as of July 2019, 35.5% of the known, based, uh, known treaty based ISDS cases were decided in favor of the respondent states as compared with 29.5% in favor of the claimant investors. That said, diversity of arbitrators may still be something that can be further improved in the context of ISDS. Diversity is a broad concept covering gender diversity, age diversity, ethnic diversity, and geographical diversity. Enhancing diversity is an aspirational goal to pursue, but one also needs to take into account the reality that ISDS cases often involve very high stakes, 
both in monetary terms and in terms of public importance. And host jurisdictions should not be blamed for sticking to the quote-unquote usual suspects, the experienced and well-respected arbitrators with high standing. Enhancing diversity is something that must be grounded in reality and requires long-term and persistent efforts. For example, through capacity building, diversity policy and appointment by arbitral institutions, and encouragement of the disputing parties to incorporate diversity into their selection criteria of arbitrators. The third concern is that of costs and duration. The cost and duration of investment arbitration have also been criticized for being excessive, resulting in enormous financial burden on investors and states, and not being inclusive to small and medium enterprises. Existing empirical studies have shown that ISDS does not come cheap, with an average party cost standing at approximately US dollar six million for claimants and approximately 4.9 million US dollar for respondents. This claimant being investor, respondents being states. In contrast, the mean, ISD, the mean exit tribunal costs and the mean UNCITRAL tribunal costs were approximately US dollar 920,000 and US dollar 1.1 million, respectively. The length of investment arbitration has also raised concerns, taking an average duration of almost four years for the arbitration proceedings to result in an award. The excessive cost and duration may even render a successful claim in an investment arbitration a hollow victory. In the famous Mataclart versus Mexico case, while the claimant company was eventually awarded 17 million US dollar, the proceedings lasted for approximately five years, with costs going up to approximately 4 million. And in fact, the former CEO of Mataclart was so dissatisfied with the arbitration experience that he said he ha if he had to do it all over again, he would not pursue arbitration. States are also concerned with the high costs of ISDS because such cost is paid from the public fund. And in fact, such high costs may impose a disproportionately heavy burden on developing states with scarce financial and human resources, and indeed, perhaps even the expertise, and compete with the other urgent development needs of those states. Some may dismiss this concern as not genuine. Nevertheless, the question is no longer whether the concerns over ISDS are real or not. The question is no longer whether ISDS is indeed a legitimacy crisis. The question is no longer whether ISDS really needs to be reformed. The battle has unfortunately been lost, and on those fronts, uh, on those fronts and the debate has long moved past those questions. The criticisms against ISDS and the negative perception resulted from, whether you call it misinformation or otherwise, has apparently become so entrenched that even UNTECT has concluded that ISDS faced a perceived deficit of legitimacy. So we now deal with the chaos in the evolution itself. Why are we now in this chaos in the light of all these concerns? Uh, various international organizations such as UNTACT, UNCITRAL, OECD, EXIT, Energy Charter Conference are simultaneously undertaking projects on ISDS reform with different scopes. Since 2017, UNCITRAL has embarked on probably one of the most ambitious projects in its working group three. There are over uh, th there were over 400 delegates from around 100 states and 70 observer organizations participating in its latest session in Vienna in October. The representatives of the Department of Justice uh, of Hong Kong have also joined as members of the Chinese delegation to participate in the process. Tension was genuinely felt in the room. Every working session was characterized uh, by fierce debates with constant tug of war between states that want a complete overhaul of the ISDS regime and those believing that the incumbent enhancement of ISDS are the way to go. 
At the same time, there are jurisdictions which apparently want both structural and non-structural reforms of ISDS, uh, reforms of ISDS, while some jurisdictions, such as Brazil, have at the very beginning of the working group signaled that they would not go down the path of ISDS. Two years into the project, we have not yet seen the light from the end of the tunnel, with some states continuing to express dissatisfaction with the mandate of the working group for being narrowly confined to ISDS procedural reform and treaty-based ISDS. In the words of Stephen Schill, Working Group 3 is like a Gordian knot of competing investment dispute settlement designs. Exit and the Energy Charter Treaty are amending their rules and introducing protocols to address these concerns. States have also taken diverse approaches with respect to their investment treaty provisions. On one hand, TPP adopts incremental enhancements to the ISDS mechanism. On the other, the United States Massacre Canada Agreement heavily restricts the scope of the ISDS mechanism as compared with what it was uh, um, in NAFTA. In respect of the uh, RESEP, while the text-based negotiation has concluded, it remains to be seen whether ISDS provisions are already in the agreed text and have been put in the future framework and have, or have been put in future work program to be further negotiated following the entry into force of ARSA. Brazil has completely parted way with ISDS by adopting its own model of cooperation and facilitation investment agreements, which focuses on dispute prevention and the use of ombudsmen to resolve disputes. We also see the re-emergence of the Calvo Doctrine, uh, for example, in the new model of BIT of India, which requires exhaustion of local remedies before resorting to ISDS. These approaches were adopted in recent years and attempted to shift the paradigm away from the traditional ISDS. You may call the present landscape of ISDS as one characterized by the diversity, or you may describe it as chaos. Nevertheless, now trying to look for an order within this chaos, just as contradiction is an essential element of life, chaos is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, to use the quote of Jose Saramago, a Portuguese writer and recipient of the 1998 Nobel Prize in Literature, chaos is merely order waiting to be deciphered. I started today's lecture on Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. Now I would venture to propose a tale of two options, a double helix approach to decipher the order within the chaos in the evolution of ISDS. As a start, we need to be clear what, about what our objective precisely is. The objective, I believe, should be to restore the confidence in ISDS to overcome the current legitimacy crisis while preserving the essential attributes of ISDS which make it work in the very first place. In this regard, the G20 guiding principles for global investment policy making agreed in the G20 ministerial meeting in 2016 is particularly instructive on what the essential elements of legitimacy are. According to the G20 guiding principles, the dispute settlement procedures for investment disputes should be fair, open, and transparent with appropriate safeguards to prevent abuse. It is clear that ISDS regime should be based on the rule of law and provide legal certainty and access of, this, uh, of investors to effective mechanisms for the prevention and settlement of disputes. With that objective in mind, my proposed double helix approach will seek to address both structural and non-structural reforms and encourage the complementary use of different types of disputes resolution mechanism to enhance the practice of ISDS. The first trend of the double helix approach involves looking at a standalone ISDS appellate mechanism as a structural reform for investment arbitration. This is what I would like to call the first trend of the double helix approach and uh, uh, to look at the reform of investment arbitration and in particular 
on the option of a standalone ISDS appellate mechanism. I've broken the areas to look at into a number of areas, um, as you can see in the index that you have in front of you. And the first one is I want to give you a conceptual model to think about. A standalone appellate mechanism is an inspirational concept, but it must be able to cover two types of investment arbitration, broadly described as exit and non-exit. The Exit Convention provides a self-contained exit treaty-based arbitration system with enforcement of exit awards being automatic without the possibility of national courts reviewing the award on the grounds uh, or, or on the basis of grounds of refusal of enforcement. On the other hand, the non-exit arbitration is in principle governed by national arbitration laws. With the, X, with the ISDS awards subject to the possibility of a setting aside action at the place of arbitration and to an enforcement action under the New York Convention in other jurisdictions. If we are to look, if we are to work on an appellate mechanism, it must be clear that such mechanism is introduced to adjust the unjustified I would say, unjustified inconsistencies in the interpretation of the treaty provisions and other principles of international law by the arbitral tribunals. While the uh, idea of appeal may have some tension with the idea or the attribute of finality in arbitration, it is not necessarily an enemy to investment arbitration, which generally involves matters of public uh, interest or higher public interest. In fact, quoting from the UK Departmental Advisory Committee on Arbitration on the Arbitration Bill back in 1996. Um, the, the, they looked at the suggestion to abolish the right of appeal, and it was concluded, and I quote, a limited right of appeal on point of law with sufficient safeguards in place is consistent with the fact that the parties have chosen to arbitrate rather than litigate because it can be said with force that the parties have agreed that the law will be properly applied by the arbitral tribunal with the consequence that if the arbitral tribunal fails to do so, it is not reaching the result contemplated by the arbitration agreement. Section 69 of the Arbitration Act is a fine example of providing a limited right of appeal on point of law, which is a model that we can refer to in designing the ISDS appellate mechanism. Hong Kong's arbitration ordinance have also provided for an opt-in scheme for making an appeal against arbitral award on question of law that is similar to the Section 69 of the UK Act. Conceptually, one can look at the international practice, and in respect of international tribunals, only a few feature appellate mechanisms for reviewing decisions of the first instance. Some examples include the appeals tribunals of the international criminal tribunal, uh, appeal chambers of the international criminal tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and international criminal tribunals for Rwanda uh, in Geneva, we have the crown jewel of the World Trade Organization, its standing appellate body. The standing appellate body may directly address the concerns regarding inconsistencies. So those, I hope, give you some ideas of the concept to look at. The next question to be addressed is, should this body be centralized or decentralized? First, if the objective is to ensure consistency and coherence in ISDS awards, we are probably looking at a centralized, standalone appellate mechanism, one that is based on a multilateral treaty instead of leaving the appeals to be conducted by a bilateral mechanism formed under individual BITs or domestic courts, which may or most likely further aggravate the inconsistencies in the ISDS awards as a result of different approaches and different standards of review adopted in their pallet procedures. So therefore, one probably, if it is to address inconsistencies and, and the like, uh, go for a centralized body. Then what about the scope of review? Just law or fact? This particular question um, is a very important question, um, whether it should be limited to error of law or should it also be allowed uh, for one to look at the error of fact. 
Uh, appeal is a balancing act between finality and correctness. And again, in this regard, Section 69 of the UK Arbitration Act provides for a limited right of appeal on a point of law. And within this limited scope of review, the English courts have recognized the appeals will not likely be granted, and there will be a degree of deference accorded to the arbitrator's decision on a question of law. In reviewing if there is an error of law in the arbitral award, the English court will read it, and I quote, in a reasonable and commercial way, without approaching it with a meticulous legal eye, endeavoring to pick holes, inconsistencies, and faults in awards, and with the objective of frustrating the process of arbitration. Now, while the question of law is dealt with under Section 69 of the UK Act, uh, is one of English law, it does provide a basic blueprint, I would suggest, on which we can build the appellate mechanism for ISDS. If we look at the WTO appellate body model, the scope of review is also confined to issues of law, and it sets covered in the panel report and legal interpretations developed by the panel. And the appellate body has no authority to take up the role of triers of fact, to examine new factual evidence or re-examine existing factual evidence upon which the panel report is based. Even if we are to follow the 69, Section 69 of the UK Act or the WTO appellate body to confine the scope of review to errors of law, it is inevitable with the ingenuity of lawyers that ISDS appellate mechanism will have to address the more difficult question when the losing party tries to disguise an error of fact as an error of law, as well as when the application for appeal involves a mixed question of law and fact. In the context of the UK Act, the English courts have been strict in rejecting attempts to dress up erroneous factual findings or procedural errors as an error of law, and with respect to mixed question of law and fact, adopted a higher threshold, which it will interfere only if, and I quote, on the facts found as applied to that right legal text, no reasonable, no reasonable person could have reached that conclusion. In the context of WTO, there have been attempts to characterize an error of fact as an error of law. And in this regard, the WTO appellate body has also reminded in a number of cases that its role is different from that of the panel, which has exclusive jurisdiction over factual assessment and its scope of review is limited to issues of law covered in the panel report and legal interpretations developed by the panel. Under such mandate, it is considered that even a manifest error in law, uh, sorry, a manifest error in fact, should not be reviewable by the appellate body. There is, of course, the complicated question as whether an egregious error of fact can constitute an error of law. The jurisprudence of Section 69 of the UK Act is also uncertain on this point, with some cases holding that factual findings made by the arbitrators, which have no basis whatsoever in evidence, amounted to an error of law. Similarly, there are some uncertainties on this tricky issue under the WTO jurisprudence, but such jurisprudence I would suggest, points to a higher threshold under which the egregious error of fact has to call into the question of the good faith of a panel, one that may be described as a deliberate disregard or a willful distortion of facts. The latter, I think, the WTO's approach, may be a better approach to discharge attempts to raise uh, an egregious error of fact as an error of law. Having suggested a narrower concept to law and perhaps even excluding egregious error of fact, one, may then, one, one then needs to look at whether the appeal is one as of right or only with leave, another aspect uh, that has to be considered. Uh, from the experience of WTO appellate body in which an appeal is essentially as of right, an average of 65, sorry, 68 percent of the panel reports were appealed, with the rate of appeal in some of the years reaching over 80 percent in 2014, or even 100 percent in 1999. 
Given that the stakes in ISDS disputes are generally quite substantial, both the host jurisdictions and the investors would tend to launch an appeal if they were unsuccessful in the first instance arbitral award. As a result, it would be sensible, I suggest, uh, to model upon Section 69 of the UK Act to require the applicant to obtain leave to appeal from the standalone ISDS appellate mechanism to filter out frivolous appeal applications. And in the interest of time, I won't go into the test of granting permission as laid down in the case law. As you may observe, Section 69 of the UK Act demonstrates a fine balance between finality and ensuring correctness in the application of law through this permission system to filter out the frivolous appeal applications. And this is what I would suggest uh, should be considered or adopted. We talked about consistency. So the next thing to think about is, do we then have a doctrine of stare decisis? The doctrine of stare decisis is a common law concept that may, be may not be applicable in the context of international law, um, even if we are to build this uh, appellate mechanism. It functions well within a sovereign state where the Constitution provides for a judicial approach that protects and respects that. This concept has no bearing on international law, yet previous decisions always have referential value. To take the words of Christopher Thomas, a simple priority in time does not create a priority in law. And one should not assume that the pre precedent originating from an earlier decision of the ISDS appellate mechanism will necessarily be good law. In the practice of the WTO appellate body, it is not a formal doctrine of stare decisis, rather it operates in a de facto form of precedent under which the panel would not depart from the reports of the appellate body absent cogent reasons, especially with the same legal question, uh, when the same legal question is at issue. Um, I would think, um, although it needs a lot more discussion, probably the WTO appellate body concept would be more apt in the context of um, an, an appellate mechanism um, in investor state matters. The next question we have to think about is that of the adjudicators, the judges, the arbitrators, the adjudicators, the ad hoc committee members, whatever you want to call them, but those who um, decide on the cases in, under this appellate mechanism. This is a very important question in respect of ISDS appellate mechanism because it is these adjudicators that gives decisions, um, uh, give the decisions of the appellate tribunal a higher authority and a higher quality than those of the first instance arbitral tribunal. And to quote from Sir Ali Lotopat in his seminal aspects of the administration of international justice, he said this, the mere fact that one person has been set in a position to pass judgment on the verdict of another does not give the second decision a greater quality than the first. The concept of appeal reflects an unarticulated assumption that those to whom appeal lies are as judges in some way better than or superior to those whose judgment is being reviewed. If that element of superiority is lacking, Appeal is merely the substitution of one person's view of the situation for that of another. And this brings us to this very important of question, who will be the adjudicators for this standalone appellate mechanism and how should they be selected? An important lesson I think we, 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 we have all learned from WTO is the current paralysis of the appellate body with only one member left um, in a supposedly seven-member body. And this is mostly a result of the WTO's consensus-based procedural practice and the United States blocking on the appointment of the appellate body members. Then we look at the use of an election to appoint people of high standing and integrity with knowledge in, inter in public international law and experience in handling investment disputes. Nevertheless, the use of an election system should be considered again with caution, 
Speaking from his experience with the International Court of Justice, Sir Christopher Greenwood has, in the lecture held in the Department of Justice in 2018, reminded that while attracting the right sorts of lawyer with the right sorts of knowledge should be the objective in the composition of the adjudicators of the standalone ISDS appellate mechanism, the nationality of a candidate of a candidate might often, in reality, be the decisive factor if an election system is adopted. An option that is worth considering, in my humble view, is to form a pool of adjudicators that is similar to the exit panels of arbitrators to hear the ISDS appeals. This can, on one hand, ensure diversity of adjudicators, and on the other hand, address the concern over the appellate mechanism being overloaded with cases. So I would suggest that we look into how um, the exit panel has been used um, in order to devise the adjudicators for such a pallet mechanism. The more difficult question is the interface uh, between the existing um, regime and, and the mechanism. For exit arbitration, under Article 53 of the Exit Convention, it provides that the award shall not be subject to any appeal the multilateral treaty for the establishment of the appellate mechanism can overcome this by operating as, uh, as an inter se amendment to the exit convention among the relevant contracting states. Now, this was actually a suggestion came from Professor Albert Jan van den Berg when he came and gave uh, a talk in the ISDS uh, Mapping the Way Forward uh, conference in February 2019. Um, you should, uh, I think you have the proceedings um, with you um, on your seat and, and, and you'll be able to find some of his uh, very uh, good suggestions. For non-exit arbitrations, the interface will be more complex. National laws have to cater for different remedies for recourse to arbitration, whether the appeal is as of right as well as the scope of the appeal. If the centralized appellate mechanism model is to be adopted, then the national courts will have to effectively surrender their jurisdiction over such non-exit arbitration and treaty-based arrangements have to be in place. Enforcement of the awards made by the ISDS appellate mechanism is uh, a complex and difficult question, so I won't go very much into that. Uh, this is an important uh, enforcement mechanism for awards made under this uh, arrangement. And therefore, while it is open to have a multilateral treaty for a new centralized appellate body for its own enforcement mechanism, but a more practical approach probably is to try and allow the award to be enforced under the existing either the exit, the Washington Convention or the New York Convention. Um, but that probably will depend on how you design or how one designs such a pallet mechanism um, in order to make all this work. I would also now, if I may, try to look at the design, institutional design of the ISDS appellate mechanism, whether it is a new permanent body or whether it should be built on existing platform. For the establishment of a centralized, standalone ISDS appellate mechanism, a fundamental consideration is whether we should set it up as a completely new permanent body or build on such existing mechanisms. The establishment of a new permanent body can potentially be a daunting task as it is necessary to figure out how such body is to be funded, how to set up the secretariat, the complex question of deciding the jurisd uh, which jurisdiction to physically host the mechanism, etc., etc. And if, if, it is, if it is believed that a standalone dependent mechanism can address the perceived legitimacy def def deficit, as UNTEC called it, a more practical option is perhaps to build on the existing platform of EXIT. Given that EXIT is a dedicated and sophisticated platform with demonstrated track record in handling ISDS disputes, we can model upon the annulment procedure to devise an appellate mechanism which reveals not only the procedural integrity of the arbitration, but also any error of law in the arbitral awards. 
In fact, the panel of arbitrators from which the chairman of the Administrative Council appoints the members of the ad hoc committee for the annulment procedures of exit can readily serve as a pool of diversified, experienced and knowledgeable adjudicators for the ISDS appellate mechanism. I then turn to the much discussed multilateral investment court. Is it a revolutionary option? In respect of the possible structural reform options for ISDS, and that's the multilateral investment court, proposal has attracted much discussion in the current debate. In the words of Judge Charles Brower, the MIC can be monstrous, called the 15-headed Hydra. His greatest concern over the MIC proposal is that it would take away the party appointment and result in repoliticizing or repoliticization of international investment disputes, which are the very elements that ISDS work in the very first place to get, get um, away. Party appointment, as uh, we know, is the, one of, is the second tenement of arbitration and a reflection of the principle of party autonomy in arbitration. And as observed by Judge James Crawford, the elimination of party appointment for investors under the multilateral investment court proposal would further limit the pool of adjudicators and aggravate the concern over the lack of diversity and adjudicators he also seemed to be concerned that the MIC proposal would be biased towards states. At the end of the day, investors are practical and business savvy. In the Alexander Lecture in 2015, Judge Charles Brower coined the term investomercial arbitration to describe any third-party mechanism, whether contractual or treaty-based, for the settlement of disputes between foreign investors and host state as a hybrid phenomena that escapes the strict public, private, and domestic international <coughs> dichotomies. With the, in, in, with the investomercial arbitration concept in mind, some are concerned that moving to the multilateral investment court will only leave a gap in the system, resulting in multilateral, <coughs> multi, sorry, resulting in multinational corporations with strong bargaining power opting for entering into investment contracts instead with the host states, which contain international arbitration mechanism that is similar to the current ISDS regime, but with less safeguards and less <coughs> transparency and SMEs being practically excluded from the effective dispute resolution process for investment disputes. Simply, they have less bargaining power when negotiating with host states. On the one hand, critics are not appeased by the MIC proposal and continue to see it as ISDS in disguise, while the users of the regime feel that the MIC proposal is one that throws the baby out with the bathwater, and I quote this, uh, I think, from a paper from uh, Judge Charles Brower. In such circumstances, we wish to thoroughly consider whether the multilateral investment court proposal is indeed a revolution at all. I would like now to look at the second strand of the double helix. Uh, in this regard, we should perhaps start to think outside the box. As the second strand of the double helix approach, promoting the greater use of investment mediation can potentially enrich the practice of ISDS by giving it a new look and new life, in particular when investment mediation is already an option that has enjoyed much consensus among states. While investment mediation is not a panacea that address all concerns as compared with investment arbitration, it does offer some unique benefits, such as providing host jurisdictions and foreign investors with a, deg with a higher degree of autonomy, flexibility, and creative forward thinking, and consensual settlement agreements uh, uh, in resolving investment dis disputes and thereby preserving uh, the long-term relationships between the disputing parties. Investment mediation 
emphasizes harmony and can avoid creating arbitral awards that may be seen by some as politically unacceptable or intrusion into the regulatory sovereignty of the host jurisdictions. Given the consensual nature of mediated settlement agreements, the disputing parties will most likely comply with such agreements voluntarily, thus potentially saving the costs and resources required in post-award procedures such as annulment, setting aside, or enforcement proceedings. And certainly, there is ample room for mediation and arbitration to work hand in hand as a complementary hybrid procedure, such as MADARP, UPMADARP, and even a concurrent shadow mediator procedure, as ad advocated by experts such as Professor Jack Coe of the Pepperdine Law School. I would like to share with you the innovation in the investment agreement under the framework of Closer Economic Partnership Arrangement, uh, we call SIPA, concluded between mainland China and Hong Kong. While the SIPA investment agreement is an arrangement within one country, it contains the provisions such as fair and equitable treatment, provision against illegitimate, uh, illegal e expropriation that are commonly found in modern international investment agreements. Investment mediation is the only available detailed mechanism for resolving investment disputes under the SIPA investment agreement. Should mediation fail to resolve the dispute, the, disp the disputing parties may resort to litigation in courts. The SIPA Hong Kong investment mediation rules set out a basic framework for the disputing parties to work on and leave ample room for them to customize the mediation process in light of the preference and nature of the disputes. Um, under the rules, the parties may, in accordance with the principles of voluntary participation, choose whether to participate in or to withdraw from the mediation, and the disputing parties are required to cooperate and to act in good faith and participate actively, etc. A distinguishing feature of the SIPA Hong Kong investment mediation rules is that the default position is for the mediation commission consisting of three mediators, which is similar to party appointment mechanism in investment arbitration. And in this regard, the, uh, in the SIPA investment agreement, uh, the mediators shall have attained the relevant qualifications in mediation and shall have professional knowledge and experience in the fields of cross-border or international trade and investment law. A sophisticated code of conduct of mediators is provided under the SIPA investment mediation rules to ensure the independence of impartiality and to nurture talents and to build up a group of investment mediators. Uh, the Department of Justice have been working with the Asian Academy of International Law, with ICSID, uh, the Center for Effective Dispute Resolution, and the Energy Char Charter Treaty to provide capacity building and professional training for um, such roles. Um, and it's noteworthy to, to note that in, in the courses that we've organized in Hong Kong, we have not just focused on mediators, but we've brought states, uh, mediators, as well as business and lawyers involved so that they can understand how each other are working uh, together. Now, with the three-member mediation commission model and the robust qualification requirements, the Hong Kong, invest, Hong Kong investment mediation rules allow a greater diversity of mediators in terms of linguistics, cultural, technical backgrounds, so that uh, a lot more collaboration can be achieved with a greater balance and brainstorming exercise to create uh, creative settlements. Uh, the flexibility uh, in the rules also allow for confidentiality to be observed, and I, I won't um, go too much into that for the moment. Now, indeed, the SIPA mediation rules can serve as a template protocol for incorporation into international investment agreements or even for structuring a multi-tiered dispute resolution process such as mediation first, arbitration next. So we would like to offer that as, a, as something that can be thrown into the discussion in, in future if investment mediation as a double helix can take place. This mediation first arbitration next structure 
actually also echoes with the useful suggestion made in the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators discussion papers for the Ancitra Working Group 3 of mandating disputing parties to attempt mediation before filing a claim in ISDS. And to take the idea a step further, we may even render the initiation of the mediation automatic so that no one is worried about losing phase of being asking for the mediation. These are all things that can be further developed. Now, having looked at the two strands of the double helix, um, I would like to conclude that I think we found order from the chaos. The evolution of ISDS is going to be a long-term and gradual process that requires collaboration and efforts of all the stakeholders. Nevertheless, the key to decipher the order of the current chaotic picture of ISDS reform is always there waiting to be discovered. The key, as revealed by the history of ISDS, has always been the need for a peaceful, depoliticized, and rule of law based dispute resolution mechanism that has the trust of both host jurisdictions and foreign investors in resolving international investment disputes. Evolution, along with historical trajectory of ISDS, but not system overhauling revolution, is the path to find order within chaos. There is a Chinese saying that in every crisis, there lies an opportunity. The legitimacy crisis faced by the ISDS may present an opportunity to enrich its practice by capitalizing on the strength of investment mediation to synergize with the practice of investment arbitration while exploring the use of a well-balanced ISDS appellate mechanism to achieve the highest standard of legitimacy expected of ISDS. Thank you very much.